Hi, this is Dan Lynch, and I'm taking over Floss Weekly this time while Randall's away. I'll be aided and abetted by Jonathan Bennett, and we'll be talking about WireGuard, a new way to create secure tunnel communications and VPNs from within the kernel layer. Lead developer Jason Donenveld is going to join us, and you should too. That's coming up next on Floss Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Dan Lynch and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 468, recorded Wednesday, January the 24th, 2018. WireGuard. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, the fun and entertaining way to sharpen your IT skills. Visit itpro.tv slash floss and use the code FLOSS30 to get a free seven-day trial and 30% off a monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash floss. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I'm your host. My name is Dan Lynch, and the astute among you will have noticed that I'm not Randall Schwartz already. That's fairly obvious. Uh, Randall's off on a cruise this week, and I've escaped. I'm in here. I'm your substitute teacher for now, but I've been warned about you at the back there, so pay attention. Um, <laughs> Randall's left me some notes. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's it's good to be back for another Floss Weekly. I'm joined by Jonathan Bennett as co-host. Jonathan, how are you doing? I am good. It's good to see you again, Dan. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's really good to see you. Yeah, it's been a little while. I think November or something maybe last year uh, was the last time we spoke. So, uh, yeah. So where are you talking to us from? I, I'm here in the corporate headquarters, the home office in, in Lawton, Oklahoma, which is a flyover state deep in the mm. middle of the United States. <laughs> In the south, excellent. Um, well, I'm still in uh, Liverpool in the UK, uh, which some of you may have guessed from my probably rather strange accent, although I'm not Australian, as people keep, keep asking me, are you Australian? Um, <laughs> when I went to, I did visit America a few years ago, and people got going, oh, what part of Australia are you from? And I had to go, I'm not Australian. <laughs> but um, anyway, enough of that. Um, yeah, so um, this week, uh, we're going to be talking to uh, Jason Donenfeld about WireGuard, which is, and I'm going to try and give a really awful, well, I'm going to give my description of it. Um, I've been doing some reading on it today, uh, although I can't profess to be an expert when it comes to encryption. Um, but it's about um, basically secure tunnels between, you know, VPN secure tunneling between systems um, and doing that within the kernel level, the kernel layer, kernel space, if you want to call it that, um, which sounds really cool. And uh, I did read, there's a, there's a big paper that uh, was attached to it, a big PDF paper. And I did confess to Jason, I only read half of it, but I did get quite far through it and um it was i'll probably finish it later i don't don't tell me what happens um so, um, so that should be good uh, so yeah jonathan do you know do you know any more about this i've actually been watching WireGuard for a while um mm. because I've, I've used open vpn quite a bit in the past which you mm -hmm. know is, is great in its own right but you know a modern replacement for it would be uh, very useful so I, i've i've been aware of them kind of watching WireGuard for some time and hopefully it will become that replacement mm. that uh, we can just kind of drop in and, and get rid of all of the old crufty open VPN stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I we'll, we'll talk to Jason about this in a bit, but I use open VPN and, and I find it's a little bit um, intensive on the processor. I don't know if you find that sometimes there's a bit of an overhead with it. Mm. Uh, it there, there is the overhead. There's also uh, sometimes some configuration issues people run into. Uh, as, a, as a project gets older and older, people have more and more little wish list items and uh, strange ways they use it. And so, you know, a new flag or a new option gets added for each of those. And uh, there eventually becomes a point to where the project just kind of lumbers under all of that weight of accumulated history. And OpenVPN seems to be there. So it's something new and fast and light, uh, hopefully that is WireGuard, is very welcome. Mm. Excellent. Okay, then. So we'll talk to Jason about that in a second. But before we do that, I need to tell you that uh, this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Uh, it's a new year, and that means new resolutions for many people. Uh, whether you're looking to jazz up your resume or just 
get some new exciting you know skills in your uh, in your quiver is that right in your quiver i suppose um yeah you can uh, you can start an exciting new career in tech uh, you can make make your professional resolutions a reality with it pro tv there's over 3300 hours of on demand training and 125 hours added weekly so it's growing all the time uh, you can stream it pro tv's courses live or on demand via chromecast roku amazon fire tv apple tv just on your pc see your desktop or on ios or android apps as well um big list of things so basically anywhere pretty much you can stream it it pro tv goes live every day and they have courses on this is important for today's show actually certified ethical hacker courses kali linux big thing with all the hackers i know that um security testers um, linux security techniques itil uh they've got isc2 uh, security certificates and loads more coming up. So um, that's kind of relevant to our security theme today that we're going to talk about. Um, so if you want to check out uh, IT Pro TV's team solution as well, if you're in a company or a group, you want to you want to work in a group. There's group pricing, um, and you can access uh, the supervisor portal which will let you uh, gain control over your team's training and schedule, manage your custom groups, um, set assignments for people, see how they're getting on by reviewing the stats and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so join more than 85,000 IT Pro TV members today and get the IT job you've always dreamed of. So visit itpro.tv slash floss and use the code floss30, that's floss30, for a free seven day trial when you sign up for an individual monthly membership. Um, you'll also get 30% off that membership uh, for the lifetime of the subscription. So, for you know, as long as you keep the subscription going, you're going to get that 30% discount. Um, if you're interested in learning more about IT Pro TV's team solution, uh, sign up for a free demo and try out their supervisor portal. Um, it's uh, friendly training, binge-worthy content, and life-changing results. So that's itpro.tv slash floss and use the code floss30. All right, then. So enough of that. We should bring on our guest. So, Jason, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hey, um, I'm loving your mic technique there. We had some. We, we were geeking out about microphones before. Jonathan's a big microphone kind of audio geek as well. Um, so uh, yeah, Jason Donenfeld. We're we're going to talk to you about WireGuard. Yeah. So first of all, um, where are you? Where are you based? Where are you talking to us from? I live in Paris, France. Paris. Wow. Excellent. So you're even further. Uh, let me go back to this. I nearly said east, west. I don't know. I'm, I'm confused with my direction. I don't know why I'm pointing. It's over there somewhere. It's, it's over there somewhere. Um, yeah, so you're in Paris. So you're even more further into, into Europe than I am. Um, excellent. So, um, yeah, it's a, a great connection to Paris. So we're here to talk about WireGuard. Um, so I'm going to ask Randall's kind of usual opening question, which, uh, as he describes it, is the kind of 30,000 foot view of, of WireGuard. So can you tell us... Um, just roughly what kind of WireGuard is and what problems it solves, and then we can drill down a bit more into the detail. Sure. So WireGuard is a secure networking tunnel. So it can be used for things like VPNs, for things like connecting data centers together uh, across the internet, um, kind of any place where you need to join two networks together in a secure way, WireGuard comes into play. And in the past, there have been a couple of solutions for this. Uh, Well-known ones are IPsec and OpenVPN and each kind of have their big problems. Um, they're extremely complex, massive code bases, um, kind of bewildering protocols with um, decisions made made on uh, kind of the crypto that we had in the '90s, but not really, not really the things that we know since. So WireGuard kind of starts from a clean slate and a couple of new ideas and breaks down the the assumptions we made in the '90s and um, has kind of a really clean. Uh, uh, pristine protocol um, that we've actually implemented in less than 4,000 lines of code. So it has mm. a super small base, um, which means that anybody can read it. Um, it you don't need to be uh, 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 expensive security firm with a massive staff of uh, you know hundreds of people to divide it up into chunks to read it. It's, no, it's the kind of thing that kind of anybody interested in the security can sit down and read it in an afternoon. Um, and this aspect of auditability is really important. So we want something that's secure, that uses modern crypto, uh, but it's something that people actually can read and trust from from being able to study it. Mm. And uh, what kind of, um, I mean, you mentioned there that the, the, we talked at the top about OpenVPN and some of the kind of issues that, that we've noticed with it. And these are quite kind of old solutions that... Um, 
that are based on, you know, as you say, old, the way cryptography worked in kind of the 90s and, and the technology that was around then. But what led you to um, to want to, to make WireGuard? Was that the main focus that you thought, I want to make something better than, than what's there? Uh, there are kind of two strains. Um, one is that I, uh, I moved to France and I wanted to get US Netflix. So I needed to run a VPN <laughs> one way or another. Uh, so I had like a personal interest in running a VPN. Um, and when I, when I sat down to set something up, um, I really just wasn't comfortable running IPsec or OpenVPN. I mean, I, I've used them for years and I know how they work very well, but I didn't want to really run that on, on my laptop, for example, a system that I have to trust because it's my main system. It, it was just too scary of a code base to trust. And, uh, and having reviewed it many times, there are all sorts of terrifying issues with these things. And so it's just... I didn't want to run anything that was out there. Um, then, then there was kind of another strain, which is um, I, um, I I work in the security industry, so I do a lot of uh, both offensive and defensive security. And mm. I've been working for a long time on, um, on kind of a, a rootkit exfiltration method. Um, so oftentimes when you're in a network uh, doing a, a red team assessment or penetration test, you want to... Um, be able to maintain some persistence in the network for the duration of the assignment, then also be able to exfiltrate data in a stealthy way um, so that you can uh, avoid the, the detections, um, so that you can, you can get the, the, the data out in a secure and stealthy way. And uh, I realized is that a lot of the same techniques that I needed for secure exfiltration are actually perfect for a defensive VPN. Um, so WireGuard has a lot of these nice kind of stealth features built in where you can't scan for it on the internet. It's, it's undetectable unless you know where it is. It won't respond to unauthenticated packets. Um, and again, it has a very small code size that can fit inside the kernel. Uh, so co- kind of a combination of both these things is um, these offensive concerns. I, I need an exfiltration method and a rootkit. And then these kind of personal things, you know, I, I need a, a VPN that I, that I actually trust to run and, um, uh, and so WireGuard kind of came from these two strains together. Mm. Hey, I want to jump in if I can. Did you say 4,000 lines, 4K lines mm. of code? That's right. It's less than 4K. I, I think we're at 3,700 right now. I mean, it, it varies, but yeah, less than 4,000. D- does that include the routines for doing all of the crypto or all of those farmed out to libraries? No, so that I mean that obviously doesn't include the crypto primitives, right? But these are kind of you know well, well understood algorithms that that are implemented in the libraries, of course. Yeah. Uh, so this is just kind of the core logic of the protocol. Um, whereas if you look at things like OpenVPN and IPsec, um, the core logic of their protocols winds up being like way bigger than the primitives. Um, you know, we're talking like the order of hundreds of thousands of lines of code kind of thing that you can never sit down and read an afternoon. And even after so many assessments and, uh, and teams auditing these code bases, people are still finding bugs because they're just too big and complex. Um, uh, and and they're, they're, they're old code too. Um, so yeah, so less than 4,000 lines of code. We're trying to keep it really clean and simple. So how, how hmm. have you managed to, to do so much with so little code? Are there any, you know, the secret tricks that you can share with us, or is it just all about <laughs> simplicity? Uh, so, I guess there there are a couple of things. Um, there aren't any secret tricks in like, <laughs> you know, coding in a compact way or something, right? No, I don't want that. I want the code to be readable. So, um, mm. there have been considerations from the beginning on keeping what WireGuard is and what it does very minimal and simple. Um, so, for example, the protocol that's using the cryptography. When we're designing the protocol, uh, thinking, well, how can we make this so that the state machine that this will inevitably require is as simple as possible? And these types of decisions then went into the cryptography we used in, in developing it, uh, which then ultimately result in a tiny implementation. There are other things like all the fields in the protocol are fixed length. Um, so we don't have to have any parsers. We just have kind of fixed length messages, fixed length offsets. And so if there are no parsers, then there are no parser bugs, right? Um, so kind of a, a bunch of simple things like this and uh, have all kind of added up to make it extremely simple core code base. 
so with that simplicity, is there a, a limitation of, of use case? So are, are, are there going to be still some you know, obscure use cases where someone has to go use OpenVPN or IPsec? Uh, yes. And, and here's where that comes in. WireGuard doesn't try to handle the, uh, the key distribution problem. Okay. So both IPsec and OpenVPN uh, have support for using certificates, X509 certificates. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I should mention, when, when you try and use X509 certificates, you wind up implementing something called ASN1 to parse it. And ASN1 parsers have been the victim of so many vulnerabilities through the years. Uh, this is like really kind of ugly thing. Uh, but in any case, WireGuard doesn't try to do the key distribution problem at all. Um, Instead, it operates like what you're used to using with, um, with SSH, where you have these really short base64 encoded public keys, and we exchange them somehow. It could be through GPG email, uh, uh, it could be in person, it could be through some other mechanism like TLS, if you're into that, uh, LDAP, if you're into that. So sort of any existing thing that already does key exchange uh, works fine with WireGuard. Where all WireGuard cares about is, I know your public key, you know my public key, a priori. Um, and so these are, I think, 44 characters of base64, so you can copy and paste them around. Um, but then it also nicely stacks into these other things people already know how to use, like uh, LDAP or you know, databases, TLS, uh, email, uh, whatever other kind of mechanism. Whereas these other solutions like OpenVPN and IPsec, um, and I guess especially OpenVPN are kind of certificate centric. Um, and that's not something I want to impose on people. Um, but on the other hand, it means that people coming from OpenVPN might be a little bit surprised to find out, oh, there are no certificates. Uh, we have to share public keys through some other mechanism. Hey, so a follow up on that. Uh, you, you mentioned something about um, something earlier about not being able to scan for this, uh, so it, I wanted to ask a couple of questions about that. Does it use like TCP versus UDP? And then, are you doing hmm. something like an HMAC protocol to uh, to filter out packets that aren't signed? Yeah, so um, it uses UDP, right? So you um, you don't have any concept of a connection, so you can't scan on that basis. Um, I, I think your question about an HMAC protocol is. Uh, is related to the OpenVPN TLS off uh, parameter. Um, and WireGuard does have something similar, but it works even better than that. Um, so with WireGuard, the key exchange happens in two messages. I send a message to you, you send a message back to me, and then we can talk. Um, if you were to scan on the internet, it would mean that if, if I'm a malicious scanner, I send some junk to you, and then you reply back to me, and you reveal your location. What WireGuard does is it includes some authentication information in that first message. So if I'm a random scanner and I just send you junk, you'll know that it's junk and you just won't reply. You'll be totally silent. Whereas a legitimate user would send you a legitimate message that has authentication data in it. And you'd be able to authenticate, yes, this came from a legitimate user, and now I'll reply. So HMAC, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delve a little bit into crypto geekiness here because this is kind of mm -hmm. one of the fields I work in a lot. HMAC is the hashed, method, hashed message authentication check. And what it does is it, um, it takes the message and it hashes it and then it adds a password to the end and hashes it again. And it's kind of this convoluted thing that we have to do because SHA-256 has a weakness that you can add something onto the end of a message and then continue the hash. Which you know that's that's kind of a, a deep crypto thing. I noticed that you guys mentioned that you're using Blake two as as one of the things that one of the crypto technologies. Uh, Blake two has built into it this idea that uh, you you can't use this you know length extension attack. So is is that what happens when you when you punch your password in that it it basically uses that password in Blake two to sign that initial packet? Of uh, kind of no to the above of. of everything you mentioned. There's kind of a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, a lot of things just right here. Um, so first of all, we're never talking about passwords. We're only talking about keys, um, well, which sure. are usually randomly generated 32-byte uh, strings, um, which is very different than a password, which doesn't have that much, uh, that much entropy. Um, 
So what a HMAC does is it will take a cryptographic hash function and turn it into a pseudo random function, um, which is kind of like a hash function that takes a key. Um, mm -hmm. And HMAC is a nice construction for making this out of most hash functions, such as uh, SHA-256, as you, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there are other hash functions, like in WireGuard, we use um, Blake2, um, which as a hash function isn't vulnerable to the same uh, length extension attacks uh, as SHA-256, uh, but it also has its own PRF mode, its own pseudo-random function mode uh, to make it a keyed hash without having to use HMAC. Um, so I, I, there are kind of a, a bunch of ways that you can get the same, same properties. Uh, now your specific question about um, signing things and uh, authentication. So um, the handshake does indeed use, use um, quite a bit of uh, uh, calls to Blake too. Um, but the mechanism we're using to remain silent isn't actually the same as just um, both sides have a shared symmetric key and uh, they can use this then to add a Mac on each message. It's actually a little bit more subtle than that. Um, and uh, I, I think it, it gets us some kind of stronger properties overall with the protocol uh, that we wouldn't have if we just had, say, a, a shared symmetric key. Mm. So uh, I've got to confess, I mean, I, as I mentioned, I read about this. I was reading all your kind of um, paper this morning about this and looking through the website and stuff. And um, clearly, Jonathan knows way more about encryption than I do, which is not that surprising. <laughs> so we get back into that in a minute. Uh, but I, I think we should back up just a little bit and talk a bit about the overall kind of structure, because um, there may be some people who are like, oh, God, I'm lost. I don't know what this is about. Not that I'm saying I'm, I'm like that, but of course. <clears throat> um, but um, but yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about the overall structure. So of how um, WireGuard works on the system and how you kind of how you would use it. So from looking at the notes, um, you have it, it creates another interface, basically, which is a bit like That's something like OpenVPN would do. So you end up with a WG0 interface and as far as i could tell it it seems really simple in that all the rest of my system has to do is interact with that as if it was a normal uh, interface and it will be getting clean tech uh, plain text packets you know back and all that but once it goes into that interface wireguard deals with the encryption and all of that checking the peers and all that kind of stuff so how how does that work so can you tell us a bit about how how a packet kind of travels through my system say from my system to another system with wireguard Sure. So, yeah, you, you have exactly the right idea about the setup. It's just an interface. And so it works with all the other standard networking tools um, as just an interface. So mm. um, you add the interface using the typical IP link command. You can set its IP address. You can add routes to it. Um, when you want to set the WireGuard specific parameters, uh, for example, which other peers it's going to talk to, which IP addresses those peers are allowed to be inside the tunnel, where to reach those peers on the internet, um, then you supply this using a, a command called wg, which has very kind of simple syntax. And um, there's never this notion of, am I connected? Am I connecting? What's the state? Mm. This is never really re revealed to the administrator. For the admin, you just add the interface, you give it its configuration, and then you just start sending packets. So there's no, there's nothing to, to turn on. There's an interface or there isn't, kind of, is the mm. model. Um, and then from this interface, you get a lot of nice guarantees. Um, so WireGuard has this thing called allowed IPs where you associate um, your peer's public key with the IP addresses that that peer is allowed to be inside the tunnel. So this allows you to make firewall rules that say something like, if it comes from the WireGuard interface, WG0, and it's from this inner IP address, Mm. then accept or then allow to do this something. Because you know if it came from WireGuard and it's from that certain WireGuard interface, then it must be authentically from the peer that it claims to be. Um, and, and so already you can kind of simplify your firewall rules immensely using this. Mm. And you were talking about um, a lot in the, the uh, documentation stuff about how um, it, it, obviously, I was going to say security is a big thing. That's a bit silly, isn't it? Because we're talking about secure communications. But you, you, anyway, um, what I mean is, you know, in the design, you, you, you're keeping it at kind of as simple as possible because um, it's about making it, you know, not so massively complex that there could be a lot of security holes revealed. And it seems as though in, in the design, you've taken some kind of 
clear decisions about this is how it's going to work. And we touched about a bit on that before when Jonathan was saying about could I use it for certain use cases and and so on. So was that a part of the philosophy? You you, you were like, this is how it's going to be. We're going to take everything else out, keep it simple, and that will help with the security of it and the design, of course. That's right. So generally, after you set up the WireGuard tunnel, if it's working at all, then it's mm. probably secure. Um, so there's there's very little opportunity to set it up and have it work, but have it be not secure. Whereas with these mm. other things, you know, there are a thousand ways to get it working, but you know, it, it totally breaks down. Or like IPsec supports the null cipher, or it'll work, but mm. it just like won't encrypt stuff. I mean, which is so. Um, yeah, so WireGuard has kind of a very limited set of knobs. It's it's working or it's not working. It's secure or it's just not on at all. Um, as part of this, we we don't um, we don't have any cipher negotiation. We don't have algorithm agility. So mm. uh, we're using, for example, ChaCha twenty poly one through five for the encryption, and this is it. You are not allowed to select a different cipher. Um, this one works. It's well known. Uh, it's a part of numerous standards. Um, if it ever breaks for whatever reason, then people will upgrade to something that isn't broken. Uh, but there'll never be this case where you're mixing insecure ciphers and secure ciphers on the same network because that's a terrible security idea. So <laughs> in this way, it's very cryptographically opinionated. We've chosen the things that we think are the best that will have uh, cryptographic longevity. Um, and that's what you use it it. And it turns out the choices we've made are um, are extremely performant on nearly all platforms. Um, super fast on on x86 on Intel processors, as you expect, but it's also super fast on things like smartphones and um, and little routers. So we're starting to see this in projects like OpenWRT supports WireGuard. Mm. Um, uh, people like using this on their mobile phones because uh, it's easy on battery life. Uh, but then it's super fast on Intel too, and so it's seen in in uh, in high bandwidth data centers. Uh, so it turns out the cryptographic choices we made uh, also have a, a great thing to do with the good performance of WireGuard. Mm. And and it's all, I mean, I, I kind of touched on this at the start, but it's all in, in kernel space as well, isn't it? Because obviously IPsec you get in the kernel, but people like me using OpenVPN, that's in user space as well, which is, which probably is not, I'm assuming it's probably not a great idea. Yeah, so there, there are ups and downs of both. Um, the advantage of being in the kernel is twofold. We can do a lot of deep integration with the operating system, um, which mm -hmm. which gives a much nicer interface, allows us to um, do nice things like roaming in a more reliable way where you can connect from any IP address um, or change IP addresses while you're using it. Um, but then importantly, mm -hmm. the only really way to get good performance is to do it in the kernel. When you have a user space uh, VPN, that means that Every packet has to go back and forth between user space and the, and the kernel being copied multiple times. Whereas with WireGuard, because we're in the kernel, we can do encryption kind of right on the ring buffer of the network card. We don't have to have a context switch for every packet like we would with user space. Hmm. So uh, apparently it's my turn again. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I, I, was looking at, I was looking up the Android app. I was looking up the Android app for WireGuard. Totally got distracted. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to ask if if there's only one set of ciphers, there's only one you know cryptographic recipe. If a problem is ever found in one of those ciphers, what does it look like to to go through and to update that and say, oh well, now it's a new cipher. Is this just going to be a you know a hard break of you've got previous to version 2.0 maybe doesn't work and after that release does work and, and there's just no interplay. It, it, so if, if for example, Blake 2, someone says, oh, there's this huge weakness in Blake 2, do you guys have a, a game plan to, to be able to address that without <laughs> having to blow up the world? Yeah, so uh, this could happen in multiple ways. It's like any type, any kind you gotta, at any time you have to roll out a large update. Um, you can either do it incrementally and support the new and the old at the same time for a while before only doing the new um, you can do a hard break and just do the new and not the old. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's really left to to the system administrators of, of what kind of policies they want to do. Um, the important part from WireGuard's perspective is that there isn't a negotiation of the cipher. Um, so if you wanted to support the new and the old, you just kind of run two instances of it, instances of it for a time. 
um, where you'd have two different protocols in one instance for a time, uh, which is much different than saying uh, having a negotiation between both sides to see what they support, uh, which has traditionally been vulnerable to all sorts of downgrade attacks and other nasty things. Um, so sure, if things are ever broken, it'll definitely be possible to, to update in a, in a sane way. Uh, but uh, keep in mind, these are, are very well understood primitives. And uh, I, I think a lot of people would be extremely surprised if, if, if for example, you mentioned Blake 2, if Blake 2 is ever broken, uh, it'd be a, be a big surprise. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it does sound like, um, you know, it, it's a bit of an, it could be an issue down the road, but I know what you mean. Like you've got to, you know, let's cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, I, I, you meant, obviously, I keep going back to this thing that it runs in kernel suites, but I know you're also a kernel developer. So is it in the mainline kernel, the mainline Linux kernel now? Um, and was that a challenge getting it in there at all? Uh, it's not yet in mainline kernel. Um, but so it is a challenge. We're, <laughs> Sorry. But we're, but we're <laughs> expecting it to happen this year. Um, I was recently in Korea at the uh, the NetDev conference, um, uh, which is a meeting of the people who contribute to the networking subsystem, uh, which is maintained by a guy named Dave Miller. And after the WireGuard talk, there is one question from the audience, and it was from Dave, and he said, could you get this in the kernel sooner rather than later? Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of desire for it upstream. And uh, now it's just kind of a matter of getting certain things in mm. place to make that happen. But that's definitely going to happen this year. Mm. This episode of Floss Weekly is also brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. The mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was dated and it needed a client-focused technological revolution. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, convenient, and powerful. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of your home loan options and find the best one for you, basically. Um, Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, and mortgage confidently. And to get started with Rocket Mortgage, you need to go to rocketmortgage.com slash floss. That's rocketmortgage.com slash floss. Um, they're an equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash floss. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. And uh, with those uh, bills paid, I'm going to throw back to you, Jonathan. I know you've got some more questions on this subject. Yes, yes. So one of the things in OpenVPN that was always kind of a headache is there was this these two concepts of tune or ton versus tap. And it, it was the two different ways that you could set up a tunnel, whether it did layer two routing or layer three routing. Um, what what does what does WireGuard do here? Is it is it solely layer three, or is it, it does it dive down and let you do layer two routing as well? So WireGuard is layer three only, and um, this is by design. It's really not correct to make um, a tunnel between two networks using layer two. Uh, it's a super ugly way of doing it. And by being layer three only, we can have this concept of allowed IPs, where we associate a set of IPs. Um, that each peer is allowed to be in the tunnel and have strict mm -hmm. binding between the two of them, which is a really nice security property, which we otherwise couldn't have um, if we allowed for layer two. Um, now, some people do, for whatever terrible reason, want to have layer two networks going over WireGuard. <laughs> and um, they wind up doing things like putting a, a GRE tunnel on top of WireGuard, which works fine. Um, but of course, it's not really nice at all. So. The core of WireGuard is is a layer three only protocol. I, I've I've had some cases where I needed to use layer two in a VPN, and in retrospect, that has almost always been a terrible idea. So I I, I endorse this decision. <laughs> right. I mean, had you been forced to engineer around that limitation and find out a way where you wouldn't need layer two, you'd probably have been happier with the end result. Usually when you have to use layer two, it's because <clears throat> you're having to support some broken piece of proprietary software that you can't get to the source code of. <laughs> um, so what about other operating systems? This Obviously, it's a, it's a uh, patch set for Linux that exists, as we just heard, outside the vanilla kernel. Um, are there any plans? You mentioned Android and, and you mentioned OpenWrite, which is a, a project I, I love and use a lot. Are there plans for any other... Um, 
platforms, maybe the BSDs or, or even Windows? Yeah, so as you mentioned, it's available for Linux with the kernel module, and there are packages for every major distro. Uh, very easy to install. We're working now on a cross-platform implementation um, that will let folks run it on Windows, on Mac, on iOS, and on the BSDs. Uh, so this is in progress. We're, we're pretty close to having something we want to release. Um, and uh, this will actually be user space based uh, just because it's easier to do things cross-platform there. So it'll still have better performance than OpenVPN, but it won't have as good performance as the Linux kernel implementation, which is fine because I think most people running this on their Macs are, um, are going to be kind of clients instead of servers. Um, but so yeah, uh, cross-platform implementations are definitely in the pipeline. Uh, is is there any hope of actually making this official on the iOS store? That would make a lot of people happy. Mm. Yeah, sure, sure. We're going to try and get an an app there. Um, we we we've got an app now in the Android Play Store. Um, works fine, and I don't see any reason why we wouldn't also put one in the iOS store. <laughs> Speaking from just a little bit of experience with that, um, there is a huge gulf between what. Uh, Google will let you get away with in the Play Store and what Apple will let you get away with in their Play Store. <laughs> That's right, but there's there's plenty of precedents for um, for VPN applications. Um, there, there have been very few open VPN applications in the App Store because of licensing issues um, that have something to do with the politics of OpenVPN Incorporated or something. Um, but we don't really have those same issues. We can license things any which way we want. So um, yeah, I think from our end, we, we're not really expecting too many difficulties. There are plenty of VPN apps already there. We have all the source code we need. Shouldn't be a problem. Um, so the uh, you, you mentioned it's a user space implementation that you're working on. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Uh, you said that you're planning to do that for the uh, the BSDs, but they are open source as well, and, and you know very Unix compatible. Um, are there any plans to take the the Linux kernel driver and actually port that to BSD, or, or is that just so so complicated and hairy that it's it's outside of scope? So uh, porting it uh, probably wouldn't make sense because a lot of the drivers are Linux specific. Um, that, that's generally what happens when you have drivers. There's things in the kernel; um, they're distinctly unportable. Uh, however, quite a few. Uh, developers from uh, a couple of BSDs have contacted me very interested in uh, producing a kernel space wired implementation. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if if we do wind up getting a kernel space one for, for one of the BSDs or, or a couple of the BSDs. Mm. And uh, Jason, I wanted to ask some... Um... I nearly said like housekeeping stuff. That's not really what it is, but um, that makes it sound incredibly boring. But um, some some stuff about the kind of structure of the project as a whole. It, how many people work on it? I mean, I know obviously you're heavily involved. How many other people are working on it as well? Uh, so it depends. I, I'm I'm obviously the the, the lead of the project, um, but yeah, we've got a couple people doing other various things. Um, uh, um, let's see. I guess. Kind of on and off, we usually have around four people doing stuff at any given time. Um, mm. And uh, we, we had a nice uh, Google Summer of Code last summer, um, which produced some nice code. And we hope to have another one this summer. Um, and uh, generally from the community, we're always looking for more involvement. Uh, but yeah, right now, I, I think we kind of have a healthy set of contributors uh, to the mm. project. Uh, and that's something I was going to ask, actually. Is there anything, I mean, I know um, all projects of, of this kind, of, of any, you know, open free free software, open source project can always use more contributions and help from people. But is there anything specific that you, you think, oh, it'd be great if somebody could help, you know, do documentation, translations, anything like that, that people might want to come and get involved with, you know, people listening or watching? Sure. So, I mean, you mentioned documentation, of course, we could always use more documentation. Um, there's a, a, a pretty detailed technical list of things on wireguard.com slash to do, I believe, um, mm. kind of listed some, some, some smaller goals of things we need help with. Um, uh, we'll probably at some point need uh, a hand on the, the iOS, the, the Mac and the windows work. Um, mm -hmm. I plan to be pretty heavily involved in that, but of, of course people who, use those as their everyday platform would be in invaluable. Um, mm. Yeah, the, the project is, the kernel module anyway at this point is fairly mature. Um, 
but there are a couple to-do items that, as I said, on wireguard.com slash to-do uh, that, sure, that you could take a look at. Yeah, and, and uh, what kind of, I mean, I'm assuming it's it's all in C, is it? Is it all written in C? What kind of skills would people possibly need? Same sort of thing you'd need for any other kind of kernel development? Yeah, so the kernel module is written in C. Uh, and so if you're uh-huh. going to contribute to the kernel module, you must know C. There's really no way around that. But the user space mm-hmm. implementation that we're working on for Mac, Windows, uh, iOS, Android, etc., uh, is written mm-hmm. in Go, actually. Uh, ah. And so people with, with Go skills are welcome there. Um, there are two other efforts to produce user space implementation. Uh, one is written in Haskell, and the other is written mm. in Rust. Um, so people who are into those languages could contribute there. Um, uh, yeah, I think for languages that, that covers it. So mm-hmm. yeah, we, we could really use people from, from all walks, even folks that just want to write documentation that understand uh, how networking works would be useful too. Mm. I think, um, I mean, one of the, uh, I'm going to say this with all my great experience of running a big software project, so I'm sure you'll have much more to say about this. But um, it seems in my experience of using a lot and contributing to certain uh, projects, open source projects, that documentation can often be one of the biggest challenges. As you say, somebody who understands the subject but can effectively communicate that to somebody who doesn't understand the subject seems to be one of the biggest challenges. So, um, yeah, I would imagine that's probably probably greatly appreciated. It'd certainly be appreciated to me anyway, because I'd like to understand it more. Um, (laughs) So there's always that. Um, Yeah, so I I suppose um, we we should ask as well. I mean, you you mentioned some of the things that are coming up, but are there any um, any things that you want to mention that, you you know, you're looking for the future of the roadmap of the project or anything that seem exciting that you're looking forward to or where you want to direct it? Well, let's see. Um, I guess there is something we we should mention here, which is... um, the WireGuard protocol itself uh, is a formally verified protocol, and um, this mm. is kind of a, a big deal, and I think a, a first, a first for uh, for these VPN protocols, where we have uh, a few proofs that the crypto that we've used is good, that the protocol uh, construction is good, uh, that there aren't flaws in it, which is a big deal. So. Um, uh, so we did a proof using a tool called Tamarin uh, in the symbolic model. Um, just yesterday, a, another paper from other researchers came out that does a proof in the computational model. And so w- what's neat about this project is that uh, academia is actually now getting involved, analyzing it, showing that it's solid. Um, uh, we have other verified things. For example, um, our implementation of a certain elliptic curve uh, now uses verified C. So that is C that uh, wasn't written by hand, but that was generated by a proven toolkit. Um, so th- th- these are kind of uh, next generation advancements that, that we have going on, which is nice. I think this may be the first project I've ever heard of that actually does something useful and uses formally verified code. <laughs> Most of the times they seem to just be toy projects. <laughs> that, that's right. So. Um, academia is interested in this, but I'm not an academic, right? I'm, you know, I'm interested in making real code for the real world. So, uh, indeed, a lot of academic code seems to be kind of, uh, you know, proof of concept code for a paper, but you wouldn't actually want to run it. I'm, I'm trying to straddle the divide between the two. That's, that's really interesting. That's, uh, definitely the direction that things, uh, are starting to go and, and need to go is to use some of these, uh, really interesting tools that people have. It, it, it's almost like how they describe the uh, invention of the laser. They they came up with this really neat toy, and then they said it's it's the neatest thing, but we have no idea what to do with it. <laughs> Formal <laughs> verification ha- has to this point almost been very similar to that. You know, it's it's a cool idea, but nobody's actually been able to do anything useful with it. So I'm I'm glad to hear our project is is actually doing something useful with formal verification. Um. When when you connect with WireGuard, does it kind of assign um, like an internal IP address for for the server and all the clients? Uh, no, actually, there's no assignment. Um, the IP addresses that each side is allowed to use are given upfront as part of the configuration. Um, mm-hmm. So this means in the core of it, there's no dynamic IP. Uh, there's a static assignment between a peer's public key and the IP addresses that is allowed to be within the tunnel. But with that said, it's pretty trivial to add something on top of WireGuard if you wanted to do dynamic assignment. Um, 
So for example, what a lot of uh, commercial VPN providers are doing with WireGuard, um, that, that there, there are commercial VPN providers who will sell you WireGuard service, which is kind of neat. Um, but what they do is they have um, just kind of a normal uh, HTTPS REST API endpoint, and you post your, uh, your username and password up there along with a public key that you've just generated. And then it sends you back the server's public key, what IP address you should use, um, and where to reach the server on the internet. And then you plug that all into WireGuard, and WireGuard does its thing. Um, so in that way, we can leave things like uh, dynamic address pools uh, and lifetime. And um, you know everyone wants to kind of reinvent their own DHCP-like protocol. We can just kind of leave that all out of WireGuard core and, uh, and move that space to places that are much better suited for handling it. Uh, you, you guys have very much bought into the Unix way and the old Unix philosophy of look, make a tool that does one thing and does it very exactly. well and don't do anything else. Yep, and then it becomes super easy to analyze and then you can see how all the parts fit together in a clean way. Exactly, yep. Um, so when when you have this set up and the, the, the WG0 interface uh, is populated on the server and then each individual, each individual client... Um, that that interface is, you know, it's, so it's done statically, but it's still it is it does get assigned a, an internal IP address. Is that usually pull from like the uh, the you know the reserved internal IP, uh, the non routable ones like 192.168. Whatever is 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 that how that gets uh, uh, addressed? Well, so it's it's however you want to do it. I mean, you can add and remove IP addresses just using you know IF config or IP address to the normal tools. It's just an interface like any other, um, and so you can give it addresses from from any span you want. You could give it the RFC nineteen eighteen addresses like you just mentioned. Um, you could use uh, public IP addresses with it if you wanted. Um, for for example. Um, I guess uh, I'm talking to you now from my home, uh, and ordinarily I have a really great gigabit fiber line here. Uh, but recently, every night at six o'clock, my ISP has been throttling internet connections, um, basically the ones that leave France. Um, so much so that things get impossible. So what I've done is I've gotten a, uh, a small server elsewhere in Paris that does have a good connection. And then the connection between my laptop at home and that server is really good. Um, and I set up WireGuard so that my laptop actually gets the public IP of that other server in Paris. And then from that other server, I can get good internet to the rest of the world. So I can talk to you guys with, with good <laughs> quality, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So in that way, I'm using WireGuard, but with a public IP. And that works just fine. So, so would it be fair to say that this show has been brought to you by WireGuard? <laughs> <laughs> I think so, indeed. Yep, every frame of it streamed. Uh, excellent. Uh, does does WireGuard handle IPv6? Yeah, of course. Uh, v4, v6, um, uh, you can assign them both. They're treated equally. Uh, it doesn't really care. And, and so is there some limitation on how many clients uh, you can have in one WireGuard network? Uh, right now, per interface, Um I'm restricting it to two to the 20 peers, um, <laughs> which is like a little over a million. Uh, if someone ever had a use it's case enough. bigger than that, it's enough. It's enough. But if someone you know ever you're going to get more, the guy who turns up and says, I've got a million and one computers and you're thinking right. doesn't work. <laughs> I, I mean, if that needed to be bigger, we, we could change it. I mean, I'd be like a small amount mm. of programming, but not that bad. It was just... Uh, Things were simple to limit it to the 20, so I figured, all right, I'll do that. And if someone complains, we'll deal with it then. But yeah, a million's enough. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't remember who it was, but somebody made the statement that if you had to come up with a uh, arbitrary limit in your code, it needs to be a power of two because all the other programmers feel better about things being powers of two. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if well, not if, because I want to run this, um, how do how does one go about setting it up like on, on Android? I, I noticed the description on the Android app basically says, warning, this will almost certainly not work on your phone. Um, what what does one need to do to make it, to get to the point where you can actually run it? Okay, so uh, I guess there's kind of two questions. One is, 
how do I how do I turn on Wired or how do I get it going? And the other is what's the deal with Android? So I'll I'll tell you about Android first. Um, so right now Android uses the kernel module, uh, and that means you have to have a phone that has WireGuard compiled into the kernel. Um, mm-hmm. And this means basically only custom ROMs. Uh, so like things you get off of XDA or you know Lineage OS, that kind of thing. Um, uh, does Lineage support it? Uh, so there are a bunch of Lineage ROMs you can get on XDA that do support it. Um, but the, so, the official builds don't yet? I think not yet, though maybe a couple phones. All, all, the, all the kernel trees for Lineage are done independently by random people, basically. So some of them pull in random patches that others don't. Um, uh, at some point, I, I should probably start poking them about adding it uniformly. Um, I, I, but, I, know, anyway. I know one guy that uh, is one of their maintainers, and I will go shake that tree once we get done here. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Well, I, I can give you instructions to give to him because it's, it's actually very easy to add for Android kernels. Uh, but Excellent. anyway, the deal now is, yeah, you've got to have a, a, a custom ROM. And that's a bummer. Um, that works fine for, for me, works fine for my friends, but uh, of course, that's not really a long-term solution. So the user space version that we talked about for iOS and, and, and Windows and Mac um, will also be supported soon in the Android app. So the Android app will first see, are you using a custom ROM that has the sweet, shiny kernel module? If so, great. If not, we'll fall back to using the user space go implementation. And uh, I think in that way, we'll get, we'll get full compatibility. Um, now, your other more general question of how, how do I install it, how do I use it, um, if you go to wireguard.com slash install, uh, you'll see the commands for basically every distro. Usually, it's just kind of apt get install WireGuard, um, you know, some variety of that. Um, and then from there, you add an interface with the command IP link add WG0 uh, type WireGuard and, and similar. And so, um, see, WireGuard.com slash quick start should have a... Uh, a couple commands to get you started in a side-by-side video that should show how it works. Um, if you're at the terminal and you type man wg or man wg hyphen quick, uh, you'll get the man pages that are pretty detailed. Um, so yeah, but a bunch of ways to dive into it. And then one other thing I wanted to ask about um, th- th- this project is great. It just it tickles all of the things that I that I follow and I'm interested in. Um, open wrt open right. Um, how 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 big does the addition of WireGuard make the image for? If if you're familiar enough with that that project, to even be able to answer this. Uh, how how much bigger does it make the the kernel and the resulting image when you add it? I mean, if it's just you know less right. than four thousand so, lines of code, is it is it essentially uh, nothing in the big scheme of things? Yeah. So I don't have the exact. Uh, size of the module offhand, I, I did at some point. Uh, I remember trying to optimize that, um, but it is really extremely small. Um, I mean, uh, s- like significantly smaller than having to install a whole uh, OpenVPN suite of software or IPsec strong swan. That stuff. Uh, WireGuard is really just a tiny module. Um, so um, uh, most likely, if you already have OpenWrt on on your machine now it's trivial to add WireGuard in there. It probably won't push you past your, you know, your four megabyte flash limit or however small your device is. That, that's exactly what I was going to ask because I remember when I first got started with, uh, uh, with that project, you know, the only thing you could get for a reasonable amount of money was a little four meg router. And, and I remember yeah. you know, spending hours trying to figure out, was it possible to get OpenVPN to run on one of these? And sadly, the answer is no. You can't install one of the SSL packages in just four megs of router space. <laughs> so yeah. it, 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 sounds, it sounds like, and you may have, you probably have more information than I do, it sounds like that is finally something that is feasible to be able to get it working on, on one of those small you know, $20 routers off of Newegg. Uh, Absolutely, and it works really well there too. Uh, as I mentioned, because we're using ChaCha Twenty as the stream cipher, it's super fast there too. Um, usually, those tiny routers have terrible performance with things like encryption, but actually, with with WireGuard, <laughs> it's entirely acceptable, which is nice. Uh, you can even run it on the tiny battery-powered ones you carry around in your backpack, which is cool. That's cool. Mm. That is really cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to have to look into this. I um, I, I feel your pain, uh, Jonathan. I, I had spent a long time fiddling with the the BRT54J or something like that. 
years ago <laughs> trying, trying to make it do things it probably wasn't meant to do although i hear stories of people saying they've had like minimal web servers running off them and, and all kinds that you think why why anyway it doesn't matter um <laughs> we're getting, we're getting, i suppose i suppose the answer to why is because you can um which is which is a good answer um all right and so um jason is, is there anything that we haven't mentioned that you you want to kind of tell us about before we before we run out of time about why sure. god well, I guess the one thing I should add, if we're kind of wrapping up here, is um, mm -hmm. I, I've got these stickers here, these nice WireGuard stickers, and oh. um, I'm uh, I'm mailing them out on the internet for free to basically anyone who asks. So <laughs> if you send me an email uh, to say team at wireguard dot com uh, with how many you want and where I should send them, I'll drop them in an envelope and send them. Uh, so if you want to throw one of these on your laptop, just mail them out for free. Excellent. I like that. It's kind of like our Oprah moment, isn't it? You're like, you get a sticker and you get a sticker. <laughs> you get a sticker. <laughs> free software, free stickers. Why not? <laughs> yeah. We all need a free software. One thing that free software and open source geeks like is laptop stickers. You've got to have the right stickers on the back of your laptop. Otherwise, you're just a nobody. Um, anyway, that's our kind of fashion geek fashion, um, if you like. So um, I, I was looking at, um, we mentioned that you're a kernel developer and, and lots. you do lots of other things. I, I was having a look through your web website and um getting off the kind of subject of wireguard for a minute i um i was having a look through you've got music on there uh recorded and stuff i actually had a listen before um so being that i'm sat next to a musical keyboard which frankly is none because i'm pressing it now but never mind um I, I couldn't let it go past without asking you a little bit about music so you've got some stuff on there like improvisations and stuff um uh, is that sorry, a live band uh, oh i'm sorry you listen to those they're, they're they're quite old uh ah. Uh, kind of embarrassing recordings, but yeah, I guess some of those are with a band. Some of those are with my loop pedal at home. Mm. You know, some of them recorded on different things over the years. Um, but mostly, though, I'm I'm playing at the jam sessions in Paris. Uh, Paris is a really great jazz scene, um, mm -hmm. and uh, you're kind of a, a group of us that uh, we all kind of know each other. Small scene, and uh, we play together uh, pretty mm -hmm. regularly. They're mm -hmm. kind of weekly jam sessions. Um, Sweet. Yeah, I should put up some new material, though. Uh, yeah. Well, totally that was counts. going to be one of my questions. Yeah, the latest one was 2016, I noticed. So when's when's the new album due? Because we're all waiting. <laughs> oh, I don't, I, I don't know. Hopefully sometime. <laughs> okay, no, I mean, I, I, I completely relate to the whole, like, oh, don't let anyone listen to it. It sounds horrible because you never feel good about your own, unless you've got a big ego or something. You don't feel good about your own. But I really liked it. I thought it kind of reminded me a bit of The Roots or something like that, you know, a live kind of hip-hop jazz thing going on and the one that i listened to um I, I thought it might have been french that the guy was rapping in so i'm glad i guessed that right probably um oh, it you heard bit... that recording okay yeah probably yeah mm -hmm. it sounded a bit like kind of um, zion super crew or something like that you know one of those french kind of hip-hop <laughs> groups that I, I used to be really into anyway tune in next week for music outlaws because that's a whole separate <laughs> show that that i'm going to talk to leo about later um <laughs> so, so we can we can do that um yeah so it's been really good to talk to you um uh, Jason, is there, uh, I mean, you mentioned people should go to wireguard.com, get involved, uh, help support, you know, contribute to the to the project, what, you know, their knowledge and skills and stuff. Um, is right. that the best if, place to go? Just go to wireguard.com? Wireguard.com is a good resource. If you're really interested in the nitty gritty in the upper corner, uh, there's a link to the white paper, uh, which is kind of the whole academic paper explaining the protocol and decisions behind it. Um, mm -hmm. If you just want to talk about it or need some help, uh, the WireGuard channel in Freenode uh, has a lot mm. of really smart people in there who are more than willing to assist and and just kind of talk about any WireGuard-related topic. Um, there's the mailing list, too, uh, mm. uh, which is which is also linked on the WireGuard.com page, um, which is pretty active. Uh, some people submitting patches that way, others just discussing things, um, do uh, announcements there, like for, for new snapshots or... Uh, new formal verification papers, that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, join the mailing list, come to the IRC channel, uh, go to the web page mm. and uh, uh, email us uh, team at wireguard.com if you want some stickers. <laughs> yeah, don't forget your stickers, people. That's a, that's a very important thing. Um, all right, then. So uh, thanks very much for, for talking to us, Jason. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, sure. do keep us up to date with what happens in the future with Wireguard. And uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you. All right, then. So that was Jason Don Donenfeld, let me get his name right, from uh, the WireGuard project. Uh, and uh, yeah, really interesting stuff. So Jonathan, you, you clearly know way more about this than I do. So what did you think about it? 
this this is uh, this is pretty epic, actually. Um, Open VPN, like I said, it's 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 it was great. It has been great, but I I think it's time has come, and uh, WireGuard is WireGuard is the future. <laughs> um, I I will. Randall makes the statement that uh, this may be one of these shows where you know you download and play with this right away. I, I will be playing with this today and probably tomorrow and probably for the next you know six months and maybe <laughs> maybe <laughs> for as long as I do things with with Linux and computers because this is it's it, it's such an important problem such an important set of problems that VPNs solve. And to have mm. something that does it in 4,000 lines of code that you can install, you know, once they get their, their Go client running, you can install on every platform. I mean, it's, it's, it's a game changer. I mean, it's, it's huge. And so it's, mm. I, I'm, I'm really glad we got to talk to Jason. I'm glad we mm-hmm. got to dive into the, some of the nitty gritty crypto details. Uh, hopefully we didn't lose everybody when we started talking about <laughs> HMAC like two and all of that. Um, but just excellent. I really enjoy getting to talk to him. Excellent. Yeah. And it, it's something that um, it's just becoming more and more relevant, really. It's something, it's something I should have brought up when we were talking to him is, that, you know, in today's world where we're hearing a lot about surveillance and all that. I mean, I, I can turn on the TV and watch like a, a current affairs program and they're telling me how to use Tor. They tell me how to install Tor. And I'm thinking this is like the show where they normally tell me how to bake a cake or something. So clearly it's <laughs> becoming it's becoming, you know, I know Tor is a whole different thing, but you know what I mean? It's becoming like so kind of big in the public mindset. All right. And so um, we I should uh, quickly tell you before we finish about things that are coming up on the show and where you can find us and so on. Um, yeah, so um, oh, I need to scroll down a bit more. Here we go. Yeah, so obviously we're here every Wednesday um, and the show, is you can find us at uh, twit.tv slash floss if you want to find out more about the show, you want to find past shows to listen to and or watch. Um, we record at uh, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. That's Leo, also known as Leo time. Uh, that's, uh, that's also, that's five 5.30 in the UK at the moment. Um, I can confirm that from today. And uh, that's uh, 12, 12.30 uh, mid, just after midday, I suppose, Eastern time in the US there. Um, so find us out on Twitter at uh, Floss Weekly. At Floss Weekly is the handle you need to go to. Um, we're also on Google+. Plus. I believe Randall's posting some stuff through to there as well. Um, stuff coming up on the show. We've got uh, January the 23rd. So that's next week, obviously. So, uh, Randall's still away. So Simon uh, Phipps is going to be in. Um, and he's talking to Garrett Demore about Nano Message, which is a little messaging uh, tool slash kind of protocol and so on. Um, I did take a quick look at it, but find out more next week. That's a good reason to tune in. Um, February the seventh, the following week, uh, Brian Real is going to be keeping it real. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not on that show. You might hate that. Um, <laughs> so Brian Real is going to be in, and uh, he's he's going to talk about Process Maker, which is um, for for working out um, for planning out workflows for um, all kinds of things, really. Um, and organizing, you know, things that you've got to do and so on. Um, look, looks pretty cool. Lots of stuff on there. Um, have a look at uh, twist, twit.tv slash floss where you can find a link to a little spreadsheet with a Google spreadsheet with all the upcoming guests on it. And if there's a particular project that you you really like, or you know about, you, you maybe you just heard of, you want to hear more about that you hasn't been on the show or you don't think it's been on the show, you don't see it on the guest list, you can, you can tell us, you can make suggestions. We're always interested in that. Um, the best thing to do is to contact the actual project themselves if you you know someone involved in the project preferably leader of the project someone high up and have them uh, email merlin at stonehenge.com that's merlin at stonehenge.com there's a link on the on the page there and they can uh, you know jump to the um, high up the queue there for future shows and uh, um, you know we can talk about some more stuff so we're always interested in that um jonathan is there anything you want to you want to plug or, or tell us about where can people find you uh, so uh, you can find me on Twitter at JP underscore Bennett. Um, and one of the things I'll plug is we have a uh, we have our own security company, Cypherdyne, and we are very interested in the ideas of uh, remote login and doing it very securely, getting a very secure SSH session, things like that, without opening ports to the Internet. And uh, we're particularly looking at trying to provide some of this for legacy hardware. And if that's something you're interested in, hit us up. Um, you can get me at jbennett at cypherdyne.com. Excellent. Is that a Terminator reference? I know it's Cyberdyne Systems, which is slightly different, but it made me 
instantly think of Terminator. That's the company, Cyberdyne Systems. Anyway, um, yes, uh, you're yes, Cyberdyne, that's what the same thing. <laughs> it is. Excellent. Good man. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, then. So uh, thank you, Jonathan, for joining us. I need to quickly mention before we head off, actually, um, the uh, I've got a plug of my own that I nearly missed, which would have been awful. Um, I'm helping at the moment with an event called Liverpool Make Fest, which, funnily enough, is in Liverpool in the UK. It's um, it's growing to become one of the kind of biggest uh, maker events in the UK, if you like. We're getting up there. Uh, thousands of people are going to be there. It's coming up in uh, June of this year, so it's a little way off, June the 30th, at Liverpool Central Library, which is a beautiful building, huge building. It's going to be over four floors, as I said, thousands of people making stuff um, with, you know, circuit boards and LED and sol- maybe not soldier and I shouldn't say that I don't know what their policy is about that in the library but you know all kinds of cool things you can make stuff you can do stuff there's art stuff there you can come along great for kids we're trying to help educate kids about how to get into um, into all kinds of crafting and making and stuff um, so if you want to know more uh, the best thing to do is to head to Elpool Makefest that's short for Liverpool ElpoolMakefest.org um, we've got a Twitter account as well which is the same at Elpool Makefest we're currently running our, our call for makers if you like so if you want to get involved if you can get to liverpool in june end of june and you want to um, get a, a pitch or a stall in the event um, you can go to the website and you can apply but it does end in a few weeks so please do get in to avoid disappointment um and uh, yeah and come and get involved and I'm, I'm going to be doing some stuff around that with blogs and possibly videos and, and audio and stuff so if you want to follow me at um at method dan or head over to dan Lynch.org, you can find out more about that and finally, I think I should stop spamming and, and, and wrap it up. So thanks, thanks, Jonathan. It's been great to speak to you again. Yes, Dan, it was great to be here and good to work with you again. All right, and we'll see you next time on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.